Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. A mix of today's hits and hard to find favorites. Combined with the most entertaining and intriguing talk anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. She's passionate about telling stories of amazing women who are rocking the world and empowering women to live, love, and thrive. Here's your host, Katherine Gray. Hi, welcome everyone to the Live, Love, Thrive Women's Empowerment Hour brought to you by 360karma.com. We hope you're following our Women's Empowerment Conversation on our Facebook and also at My360Karma on Twitter and Instagram. Today, I have on an amazing lady. Her name is Alice Laviolette, and she was an expert witness on the Jody Arias case. So we're going to be talking about the Me Too movement and uh, domestic violence, which she is an expert at and uh, a very important topic. I'm looking forward to speaking with her. Please give a warm welcome to Alice. Hi, Thanks. Alice. How are you? <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. It's so strange, right? We just realized I said my mother's mm -hmm. name is Alice, and uh, I said, but she went by her middle name, Louise, and you said, that's my middle name, and yeah. we have this whole thing already, I this <laughs> connection. So, hi, Alice Louise. <laughs> well, well, hi, Catherine Louise. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, you've done such uh, important and controversial work, I'm going to say, uh, because the Jody Arias trial was very controversial in your in the stance that you took on it. And so we are going to talk about that. But first, I want people to understand why you even got into this uh, domestic violence arena. And uh, you had shared with me a very grim story that uh, both your sisters uh, had been brutally raped. Yes. And that perpetuated you to want to do something about that, right? It perpetuated me to want to work in a field that impacted violence against women. Yes. And um, I was going to go into working in sexual assault and one of my friends said, Alice, you ought to look at this new program that started in Long Beach. It's called Women's Shelter, and it's for battered women. And I didn't know anything really about domestic violence, but I was doing my graduate work, and I wanted to, I needed to do 20 hours of practicum. Mm -hmm. And so I went there to volunteer. And that's where it, it took you on this whole journey, huh? It took me on an incredible journey, and I was a volunteer for about six months, and then there was one position that they had open, um, and it was to design a program for men who battered their wives. And nobody wanted to do it. I didn't want to do it, but I needed a paid position. And so I started one of the first programs in the country for men who batter their wives and men who've been violent. Wow. So I've been doing work with battered women for almost 40 years and work with perpetrators wow. for 39 and a half. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And... In working with them, did it give you a different perspective on them? It gave me a very different perspective, but before I started my program, um, I did what I thought was important, which is to talk to the people who are impacted most. I think we create policy oftentimes and legislation, um, and it impacts people, but we don't talk to the people who are most impacted. So I went to women at the shelter, and I asked them, what I needed to know about their partners. And they overwhelmingly said to me, you know, the, the men and occasionally the women we're with have been abused as children. Well, that really, is, I don't think, it did that come as a surprise to you? That doesn't come as a surprise to me. Like, you know, I mean, it must stem from something, right? I, it, and they do say it passes through generations. It's, it's trying to stop it in a, any given generation so that it doesn't perpetuate to future generations, right? Yeah. That's why the work that you're doing is very important. Let me steer back to your sisters, though, for a minute, because I want people to understand uh, what <laughs> happened to your sisters that, you know, I'm sure they're curious, like, what happened that made you want to do this work? So they were two separate incidences, right? Yes, yes. Uh, one of my sisters was uh, house-sitting for me in Belmont Shore in Long Beach, California. Mm -hmm. and So this was later in life? 
She uh, was well. You were born in Jersey, right? I was born in yeah. Jersey. Jersey girl. Yeah, Jersey yeah. girl. And you made your way out here to California to finish school. To finish school. Yeah. And so your sister, your both your sisters followed you here. No, my oh. whole family moved when I was ten mm -hmm. to Arizona first. For mm -hmm. my one sister had asthma mm -hmm. and moved for her health, and then I came out here. Uh, my other sister, my sister who... So you have two sisters? I have two sisters and okay. a brother. Okay. And one of my sisters went to Fuller Seminary out here. So she came out here to finish school. My other sister stayed in Arizona. Mm -hmm. One of my sisters was sexually assaulted here in California. My other sister was sexually assaulted in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And what were these circumstances? Well, one of my sisters, the one that moved out here was um, uh, walking on the beach and was attacked and held underwater. Oh my God. And she was the asthmatic sister. And um, I guess he thought she was dead and he <gasps> left her. Oh my God. Um, my other sister and she, there weren't, uh, they never caught him. My other sister was in her home and someone broke into her home at night. This is in Arizona? In Arizona. And this is later in life? Um, or as a child? Or? No, both of these were um, young women. Mm -hmm. uh, my one sister was in her 20s. My other sister was in her 30s. And um, she was attacked and beaten up. And was she was someone she knew? No. No. She worked in a small town and he was caught and he was, she went through the whole trial. She worked as a, um, she worked in a child crisis agency and was well known in the community for her work. And um, he was prosecuted and given 30 years uh, in prison, but he came up for parole. And my father or my mother or both would go with her to the parole hearings. He just got out. Um, on, I think the year before last, and um, after serving how long? He served pretty close to thirty years. Wow, yeah, I do have a friend that this happened to. Uh, uh, she put her stepfather behind uh, bars, and he's still there. And every now and then, the parole would come up, and the parole hearings are extremely painful. And yeah. you know, I don't know how we could perfect this system, but um, I I say. A, it's so important for women to prosecute their perpetrator if they can. Right. But it is, the, the system is not great uh, as far as, you know, putting them, them through this grief again and again with these parole hearings. I don't know what the solution is, but would you agree? I mean, oh, I th I yeah, think every time they come up for parole, they're terrified. Well, the parole hearings are terrible, but the trials are usually terrible, too. Yes. Oh, horrible. So Horrible having so to face that. Not only facing it, having to um, somehow justify that you couldn't have prevented it or right. that you were, you know, they're... Yeah, uh, how they put the onus on the woman. It's yeah. uh, always unbelievable. Right. Unbelievable. It is. And, you know, I think there's a lot of listeners out there that probably have had something like this happen and that they haven't been able to they don't know who it is they don't know how to catch them they don't know how to put the perp away uh, but I always say for those women that were able to have the strength to go through that trial and put that person away God bless them because that is not an easy thing to go through a lot of women opt not to do that but I would encourage more women to do that when they can to pe get these people off the street well, yeah, yeah and, the, and you know, m a lot of the courts have victim advocates through the di district attorney's office. My sister got a ton of support. She got support from the district attorney. She got support um, from that staff. Um, she got community support. And so that was really important for her to go through that process and feel that she had support going mm -hmm. through that process, plus the family and her friends. We were all supporting her. But... but um, so you have to find, it's good to have a victim advocate, and uh, a lot of the sexual assault crisis agencies will mm -hmm. have a court advocate. Mm -hmm. Battered women's shelters have court advocates. 
Um, so this is what people should seek out if they've been in this situation. Do yes. Get, go get an advocate. Yeah, yeah. and go to a, a sexual assault crisis agency. You can get counseling there. And this is um, the type of place that you work at or have worked at. I worked at a women's shelter in Long Beach for six years, mm -hmm. and then the funding collapsed there. Mm -hmm. And I thought, who's going to hire me to do all the things I like? Yes. And I thought, nobody is. So you started so your own. I started my own business on mm -hmm. uh, unemployment. Yeah. Wow. Good yeah. for you. But when you have a drive and a passion, uh, when you help these people uh, in these programs, is that heal? I mean, I would think that would be healing to you in that this is how you're trying to do something for on behalf of what happened to you, these awful, awful atrocities that happened to your sisters? It, it is healing for me. Um, but it's also interesting because I think in a way you get secondarily traumatized or vicariously traumatized because you listen to all these stories. Uh, yeah, I don't know. How, yeah, I don't know how you do that work. I, I would find it very difficult, but I really applaud you because somebody's got to do that. Well, you know, it's what feels great is you see people change a lot and you see their lives change for the better. And mm -hmm. that's really exciting. If, right. You know, if you grew up wanting to change the world, I think you sort of one family at a time or one person at a time, uh, you, you get you get to do that and you get the yeah. luxury of spending time because in private practice, right. you can spend time with people. Right. And you get to see them move and you get to see their right. ch a change in their thinking, a change in their belief system. So in your private practice, people who have uh, had domestic violence and various things come to you for counseling? Yes. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and I have a broad-based private practice. I see people other than um, survivors of assault and childhood trauma. Um, I do count couples counseling. I do a lot of high conflict couples counseling, or um, and I see adolescents and whatever. Mm -hmm. But but when I'm working with trauma survivors, and I work with a lot of trauma survivors, there's a lot that you can use to help people through trauma, mm -hmm. and um, not just talk therapy. But you know, I've taken walks with people. I played catch with people. I've um, you know. Um, encourage people to get into theater. Mm -hmm. um, I've used film as a way to have people um, look at look at somebody else's life, mm -hmm. be able to laugh and cry for somebody else, right. and have that be healing for them. Right. And, you know, that's why I do this show. I feel like people will hear their story on here and say, oh, if that person overcame this, so can I. And that's why I like these triumph stories yeah. like yours. You know, um, and both of your sisters, are they doing well? My sisters are doing great. Great. Yeah, awesome. they're both, and they're both terrific people. And my brother is, we have a very close family, and I have great siblings. That's awesome. And I had great parents, too. And you certainly are a great sibling to go to the mat for this cause, uh, really because of what happened to them. Um, so uh, I do, by the way, think the arts are so healing, don't you? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Music, uh, theater, um, all of these things are, are great ways for people to heal from these traumatic things. Um, having support group, having counselors. Uh, so the work that you're doing must be very gratifying, but at times it's controversial. So <laughs> let's talk about the Jody Ayers case. So now okay. your background, your training is you're a psychoanalyst, yes? Or, or, I, I'm actually a, a okay. psychotherapist. But, psychotherapist. But I actually wasn't trained to be a therapist. I learned by the seat of my pants. Right. I, I, I didn't go to school to be a therapist. Yeah. So uh, I learned through my work at the shelter. Right. Um, and, and like many jobs, you know, hands-on is the, the best way to learn. Yes. Um, but I know, uh, you know, if people were to Google you, they'd find out that it's very controversial that you were an expert witness on Jody Arias' case. And uh, certainly for those that don't know the Jody Arias case, she had uh, killed her boyfriend. Right. Um, and obviously him and his family and his friends uh, think that she was a monster. Uh, you think it was domestic violence taking place there. Um, 
physically and mentally. And you kind of have an inside scoop on it that other people don't that you've shared with me. And I do want to share with the listeners. Uh, you were telling me that you went into the jail and have interviewed her um, for many, many hours and read both of their journals. And what do you think was taking place there that would, you know, make the case of why this woman snapped? Well, there were a series um, of events. They were only together about a year and a half. And by the way, I mean, she, she did confess, as battered women do. And her team, and, and she would have been, uh, felt okay about getting convicted of second-degree murder. She was okay with that. Um, so she felt she was in the wrong. Well, she absolutely felt guilty. But what appeared to have happened from all the evidence, and by the way, you know, there was a lot on television that said, well, you interviewed her as if I didn't do anything else. I wouldn't interview somebody, and even if I believe them, I wouldn't testify in their behalf. I would have to have lots of evidence, collateral evidence, to support my view. Um, it doesn't, you know, and I didn't go in with a view. And when I do court cases, I tell the people that hire me, mm -hmm. I will investigate this case if I believe it and I have the evidence to support mm -hmm. it. I can testify if I don't believe it right. or if I don't have the evidence, I will help you to strategize the case, but I won't testify on behalf of somebody who I don't believe. Now, how did you get to be uh, an expert witness on Jody Arias? Had you done many of these before many I years? Actually, actually, since 1984, since I've 1984. done expert witness. And remind me, Jody Arias was in what year? Uh, 2000, well, it started at the very end of 2012, mm -hmm. and it went through about the middle of 2013. So you'd been doing many of these cases. This is something you've been doing for years. Yes. Yes. And um, when you took on this case, uh, did you realize the magnitude of it? No. Mm. <laughs> In fact, when they called me, um, they were auditioning uh, expert witnesses for the case, and they Did had, you even know what case it was for? No. Oh. And not only that, when they told me that they said, no doubt you've heard about this case, I had never heard about it. Wow. Because I don't watch court TV. I certainly right. don't watch headline news. <laughs> yeah. And there was a day um, at a time that it was on 24-7 on these networks. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't know about it. So they were surprised that I didn't know about it. And they sent me mm -hmm. information after they asked me if I would do the case. Mm -hmm. um, and they sent me information. And I said, this information does not in any way justify what she did. Right. So they asked me to come interview her. And I came out and I spent eight hours in jail with her the first day. No food, no water. We just sat and talked. I did this uh, six hours the second day. Wait, why no food, no water? They don't bring food and water into you? No, because we were sitting in the, the interview room, and we just didn't get up. We did, she missed her lunch and that was served in jail, mm -hmm. and I didn't go out for lunch because right. we were on a flow, and I didn't want to disturb that. Right. Wow. Eight hours. That's intense. Yeah. In fact, the, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, defense team called the jail because they thought I was on lockdown or something, and I couldn't get out. <laughs> Oh, so now when you went in to interview her, you didn't have a judgment one way or the other? You didn't know if she was guilty or not? Uh, I knew she was guilty. Okay. Because she had confessed. Right, but you didn't know if she was pushed to the point, to the brink of doing this, according no. to your idea of someone that's domestically abused. Right, yeah. I didn't know that. And I didn't, I mean, my interview with her was informal she never she in fact she said i never wanted to be one of those women mm -hmm. a battered woman she never and she never pushed that she was guilty she felt guilty she took ownership yeah she was she loved him she respected him there was a power imbalance from the very beginning of their relationship but she was um she she talked about four incidents over the course of time and they were only in the same they were only in the same state 
less than a year. Mm -hmm. But there were four incidences which um, sort of escalated over time. And the last incident she described, and by the way, she did not come up with these incidents right away. I, I would talk to her about things. I would talk to her about um, fear. Was she ever afraid? And she'd say, no, she wasn't afraid. And then she described an incident where uh, he kicked her and um, she put her hand up to protect herself and her finger was broken. You could tell her finger was broken. Mm -hmm. And she said it kicked her hand and broke her finger. And she said he went downstairs and I didn't know if he was going to get a weapon or something. And I said, is that fear? Because mm -hmm. she didn't describe it as fear. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of abused women, they they're aren't not in touch with that. Or they're not afraid all the time. You know, mm -hmm. when somebody's being nice and there's there's nothing to, you know, trigger it, right. they're not afraid. Right. But when that person sounds a certain way or does mm -hmm. certain things, be, certain behaviors will trigger that fear. So, and, and so the bottom line is his family thought and his friends thought he was a terrific guy and that yes. she's a monster. But in reality, you read her journals and read his journals his uh, his blog his blog and tell us what you've come to find out about his personality and who he selected as partners well i read way more than that one of the things that i did and where we got a lot of information were from his emails and his text messages to many other women he was a mormon lay bishop and he passed himself off as a 30-year-old virgin. Mm -hmm. He was not that. Um, he was, he, from the, from the um, blogs, from, not from his blog, his blog, what I got from his blog was the terrific, the just horrific childhood that he had. Mm. Very horrific childhood. Of, um, and his, and his siblings, uh, where they were abused, that they're, their mother and their father were drug addicts. Um, there was a lot of violence between the parents and there was a lot of neglect with the kids. Um, so I, that I got from his blog, plus him telling me that he was the only, or t saying in his blog that he was the only sibling who hadn't been in jail. Um, so they all, uh, there was one sibling who was a probation officer. Um, I know there were at least a couple siblings who did some time. Um, but what, you, and you had said to me that his family and friends all thought he was this, you know, 30 year old virgin, but he indeed had been with many women and that he selected women who were vulnerable, that were vulnerable from his texts and his emails. What you would see is that he would sort of feel these women out. There would be young women, there would be Mormon women who took a vow of chastity and then didn't, didn't want to come forward because they had violated that vow. Mm. There were women who had been recently divorced, women who were battered. In fact, up until my last day of testimony, we were still finding more evidence. And so what you'd find is that he would push on these women, and if they would go further with him, he would go further with them. And so there was um, on, you know, online or phone sex happening. Mm -hmm. There were women he met in person. Um, it was always a power play. He was looking for vulnerable, weak women, basically. And yeah. and with Jody, um, he was um, in a group called Prepaid Prepaid Legal, and he was one of their motivational speakers. He had one of his best friends was the leader of the local group, and so at the big conference, that's where Jody met him. He came up and introduced himself. Yeah. Lifetime did a film that was aired during this trial, one of cases, an active case, that said based on a true story. And I can tell you that it was false from the beginning. And one of the only things that was true was that she did murder him. Yeah. That, but so much of what Lifetime portrayed, they portrayed her as insane and her coming on to him. And that didn't happen. Her mm -hmm. friends were with her. He came on to her. He uh, gave her a Book of Mormon later on. He uh, pushed for sex right away. She had come out of a four-year relationship 
where her, her former partner testified on her behalf. In fact, one of the things I look at is what is somebody like before the, you know, index, it's called the index incident. What is, what is somebody before, mm, before the before incident then, and then after? And prior to the incident, she had a four-year relationship with a good guy, and he wishes they had gotten married, but he had been recently divorced. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, she had a two-year relationship. And she's still in jail today? She's in jail for life. For life. Her case is on active appeal right now. Right, okay. You know, um, it's just interesting work that you're doing and uh, interesting perspective that I wanted to share with people today because I do think she was portrayed as this awful, awful animal person. And, uh, you know, it is interesting to hear the other side and think, hmm, you know, you may have something here. I know it's controversial. I don't, you know, I certainly don't know which side is the truth. But I do know in the case of, that I just shared with you of my friend who put her stepfather away, uh, that was in the Mormon culture as well, where everyone in the church thought he was just the greatest thing and did not believe her. And often there are cases where people just cannot believe, family and friends cannot believe the monster that lives behind uh, that person persona um, of these various uh, religious figures or just people at large. And so with this Me Too movement, I hope people are starting to A, believe women more, and B, uh, really delve a little deeper into the perpetrator and make sure that there's a fair trial in, in, in situations like this. I mean, she definitely did kill him. She definitely should be serving time for that. But, you know, was she pushed to that point? And I think that's something that you know, I'm so glad that you're bringing to light and talking about uh, at this time when this is the conversation we're having around the world, right? Well, and it's interesting because, and I'm happy you're doing this show, because at the time when Jody Arias was on trial, the media chose to focus on Casey Anthony, Amanda Knox, and Jody Arias, mm -hmm. three attractive young women mm -hmm. who were all labeled in the same, and portrayed in the same kind of way mm -hmm. when there were Unf lots of men doing horrific things. And even Interesting. when you think of the Aurora, Colorado killer, you mm -hmm. think of the Boston Marathon, premeditated murders, and there weren't lynch mobs around the courtroom. In fact, people uh, who were related to people yeah. who were injured said, we don't want them to get the death penalty. The, I think the media has responsibility in stirring up people to the point. Yes. And I think that's part of, you know, when you look at justice and you want people to have justice, the media has a role to play. And if you just watch headline news in particular, but the networks didn't cover much other than she, the you know, here's this awful woman. And, and and like what you're saying, you know, many, many more men kill people than women. So when there's a few handful of women that have been pushed to that brink for whatever reason, uh, justly or unjustly, uh, you're right. It does get a lot more media attention. And, and the media does have to make sure that they're giving these people a fair uh, trial and a fair viewpoint. And we don't know that that happened in this case, we, but we do know um, it's certainly a horrific ending. It's certainly a sad story. And uh, I just want to circle back to I appreciate the work that you're doing because uh, as someone who's helping people with domestic abuse, uh, you're at least making uh, a difference in the world to help eradicate this and help stop these generations from continuing down that path. And so thank you for the work that you're doing. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. Uh, we are so happy that Alice was on with us today. You can reach her if you need to uh, at her website, which is? AliceLaviolet.com. Okay. And also you can look for her book, uh, It Could Happen to Anyone. Yes, Why Battered Women Stay. Why Battered Women Stay. So look for her book. Is it on Amazon? It is on Amazon. Okay. Uh, so be sure to check that out. Uh, thank you again, Alice, for all the wonderful work that you're doing. And uh, 
hope the ladies listening that you're getting off the sidelines and uh, doing something amazing in the world. Uh, I always believe that uh, we all create our fate. So uh, join us at 360 Karma if you'd like to be part of our women's empowerment community. Make it a great week. Hugs and happiness.